great to be here on this wonderful occasion for Bala and uh, looking forward to this evening. The uh, Stan mentioned I, that I, he wanted me to talk about collaboration and then he said I didn't have as much time as I needed, so I cut that bit. But I should tell you that, I'm, that though it doesn't appear that way, I am so much younger than Rana. <laughs> Absolutely, in terms of years of operating detectors, building detectors, I'm a baby and he's a grandfather. But I was pleased to hear Rana at the end after saying that enabling technologies are unimportant to say that's what it's all about, the enabling technologies, and skirting over what the, how to fix the other problems. So fortunately for us all, you've, Rana has covered quite a, a few of the things that I was going to say, so I can go quite quickly through some of these slides. But as Stan mentioned, uh, Harold, Luke and I were charged with this uh, R&D coordination report for GWIC. Uh, there's about 60 or 70 people contributed to that, and I'll put their names up at the end. And we were to go through the subsystems and look at the state of the uh, technologies of the subsystems and what needed to be done to push them forward and where global collaboration would be important in achieving that path forward. You've seen this before. This is an interferometer. This is LIGO. This is based on the standard LIGO-Virgo arrangements. And down here, whoops, it's showing you in this... Uh, color-coded plot, the various subsystems and how they interact together, including the cooling system, which Rana just mentioned. They, these, these are, this Cosmic Explorer and Einstein Telescope and LIGO Voyager uh, may be different in their, uh, the way that they predict they're going to reach different uh, sources and different limits and so on, but the enabling technologies are fundamentally the same. The fundamental noise sources are the same if you're building a laser interferometer. And as Rana pointed out, it's quantum noise. Quantize the laser field, you get fluctuations in the phase and amplitude. And the phase fluctuations means you can't resolve a, a, a phase to within a certain limit, and that gives you the photon counting error. Quantum, the amplitude fluctuations beating with the, the carrier laser force on the, on the mirrors, which, can, which is random and masks the gravitational wave signal. How do we get rid of that? We want to modify the laser power. We want to use squeezing. We want really, really low loss optical components. Every photon counts. We use massive mirrors, as Brown has pointed out, and we can modify that using the interferometer topology, building things like speed meters. Thermal Brownian noise, fluctuation dissipation theorem, mirrors, substrates, coating suspensions, modified by changing the temperature, the material properties, high Q materials, what you want, very nice, things that ring very high, so away from the, re the resonance, the background noise is low. You want to modify things like the coefficient of thermal expansion to be able to, to get rid of thermoelastic noise and so on, so you choose the right materials and the right operating temperatures. And then the Newtonian noise, the direct gravitational coupling between the mirrors and the external environment those gravitational forces are modified by the location you choose, the sites you choose, subtract, subtraction schemes, and being really careful, having chosen a beautiful site, to not pollute it. So we've heard about these three de two detectors, Einstein, Telescope, and Cosmic Explorer. Some key differences, ET is underground, it's a xylophone, so it's two interferometers in the... Uh, one that focuses on low frequency, one on high frequency, and it plans to operate at two different wavelengths. 1064, that's currently used, and 1550 nanometers. Cosmic Explorer, forward scaled up to 40 kilometers, like ETs around the 10 kilometer. Upscaled advanced LIGO technology is the current plan for the first instrument built in the Cosmic Explorer facility, and that's supposed to happen between 2035 and 2040. In the meantime, the Voyager technology is refined and developed so that around 2040 we can install Voyager technology in the Cosmic Explorer envelopes. Voyager technology, 123 Kelvin operation, 2 microns, as Ryan has already explained for us. So this is the goal, technology, goal sensitivity curves. We've seen this already. And on here I show you this, the Einstein telescope curves, the uh, blue and orange, the Cosmic Explorer 1 and 2, and in the green there, uh, that, sorry, the green is the ET uh, network. And you see that they're, in general, they're pretty much the same. Some differences of low and high frequencies, and so a little bit different science is, can be done with them. 
This shows you where Voyager fits on that map. That Voyager is now in the orange between the advanced LIGO and the ET and Cosmic Explorer curves. But there's another, and these, this is the parameters that we're after. The key ones, mirror masses go up from 40 to 300 odd kilograms. Mirror materials change from silica to silicon. The uh, power, operating powers go right up. Squeeze factors go from 6 up to 10. Uh, Newtonian noise suppression by factors of 10 and so on. So these, these are the key focus on these enabling technologies, to avoiding these fundamental type noise sources. But there's also an effort to look at what can be done, and Ron has already mentioned this, in, in a four kilometer existing facilities or new focused facilities. For example, high frequency detectors. This was first developed by people like Martin of Mao, and we've been looking at this within Osgrave, Osgrave HF. So you take the Voyager technology, but you don't worry about the low frequencies. And you see what you can try and do up here in the matter region, where you're looking for the binary neutron star, the, the equations of state, and so on. And here's a high frequency Voyager curve. No, let me make sure this one. This, if we take a four kilometer, no, this is the two kilometer curve. This is for two kilometers, tuned up with long single recycling cavities. And you can see that the uh, masses have gone up a bit, but they're not around the 300 kilograms. The signal recycling lengths, it's about around 500 meters. We've got large amounts of squeezing. There's also large amounts of power in this arm. And Vishali might correct me, I've probably got the wrong curve up here. All right. Everything I just said is almost true. This is actually a four kilometer detector. It's Rana's detector tuned to around two to three kilohertz. That is Rana's detector. It's a detector developed by a whole lot of people led by Rana, where we don't worry about the low frequencies. Don't worry about the low frequencies means we can take away a lot of the suspension technology, the, the things that are really hard to do that introduce all of the noise at low frequencies because we don't care about low frequencies, but we're just trying to make it operate at high frequencies. And this would have been the, uh, we could also do this with a two kilometer interferometer, which is now, this is also the wrong curve. So I'm going to remind me to correct these, but you can go shorter. The parameters go up a little bit. They go if if we go with the uh, the two kilometer device, which this these numbers are correct, even though the plots are wrong. The two kilometer device goes from ha having the three megawatts, which Voyager would have, to five megawatts in the arm. So we are really pushing laser power and handling laser power quite a bit harder. But uh, as I'm young, I think we can do that in the fullness of time. So. There's a very brief executive summary. How much time I've got? Eight minutes. So we're going to find a new 3G infrastructure will enable successive generations. The idea is that this we don't just build one interferometer and that's it for the 3G systems. As has happened with the first generation, there's been successive inter interferometers installed in that. So you want to build the facility so it can handle at least 10 to 100 times better sensitivity than the first instrument that we install. The enabling technologies, as I said here, are substrates, coatings, cryogenics, suspensions, Newtonian noise, and this lasers. Similar at the research level, whether you build a cosmic explorer or a Voyager or an Einstein telescope. So in order for this to be achieved, we really need a coherent, broad R&D program around the world on the things that are really expensive to do. There are four areas that we identify here in particular. That's facility and vacuum infrastructure. If you're building these big facilities from triangles of 10 kilometers underground to 40 kilometers on the surface, the big price tag is the infrastructure, the vacuum system, the facilities. There's got to be a focus on how to do that in the cheapest but quality controlled way. And that will involve not just our field, but reaching outside the field to other experts. Then there's the substrates. We're going from the 40 kilogram size in the current detectors to over 200 to 300 kilogram components. And that's, there's no industry drive for that that I know of. So we have to figure out how we're going to do, do that. But Ran has already mentioned coatings. He's mentioned one po possible solution, the amorphous silicon. There are other solutions that are being developed and for the different uh, 
wavelengths. So there's a lot of research has to happen in that area. And then we need to do large scale prototyping of these systems. So as I said area, pr earlier, progress in those first three years, areas does require us to get together in a, in a more organized way. Area four, which is the prototype facilities, has received a recent boost in Europe through the Maastricht investments and the investments happening down in uh, uh, Sardinia. But the 3G techniques can also be applied back and be tested in improved sensitivity of 2G detectors, as happened for the advanced LIGO detectors is already using squeezing, that wasn't in the initial baseline, and then the, the implementations in LIGO that came from the forecast for advanced LIGO. The main cost drivers, this is the site and infrastructure as I pointed out, you need to determine a site that's really good low background, low, so we can have low Newtonian noise, we need to reach outside the community. These are the aspects that we might be looking at in terms of site selection. I'm going to jump through the next few slides quite quickly, but they'll be, after correction, available because there is a lot, if you're looking at building a community in India, of R&D that can be focused on in this collection that we're about to go through. So for the site selection, we want to look at, minimize the seismic noise, we look at the surface metrology in terms of the wind and the rain, closeness to human activity, the stability, earthquakes, the orography, and one day I'll look up what that means. The geological stability, the type of underground rock you're in, how much water is going to be inside your chambers and so on. And in the terms of the vacuum system, we might need new materials, new tube materials, surface processing, new procedures, uh, distributed pumping and so on. So there's a, lo a lot of basic research, engineering research, to make sure we build the facility which will last 50 years. The core optics, we've had three possibilities and we're going to be operating at possibly three different temperatures. Room temperature, fused silica is the only material of choice. You know, I think it's well understood that if nature hadn't presented fused silica, we wouldn't be detecting gravitational waves. But it's only been developed up to 40 kilograms. If we're going to go to large blocks of fused silica, we still have developments needed there in terms of the 3D homogeneity. Agra is using sapphire and they're running it around the 20 Kelvin. Sapphire still has high absorption and scatter, it's got inhomogeneities. They can get relatively large sizes it's in reasonable quality, uh, but it still needs to be a lot of development in that area and sapphire fibers would need to be developed. So there's a lot of research needed even though sapphire is currently being used in Kagra. Silicon is the one that's looking pretty, uh, up, like the, perhaps the best choice for low temperature devices, but silicon is uh, only transmissive above 1500 nanometers, so you may need to change your laser wavelength. It's this coefficient of thermal expansion, this goes to zero at some nice little temperatures, 18K and 123 or 124 Kelvin. It's possible to reach very good absorption, and Ron has already mentioned some of the uh, work that's been done on the type of amorphous, amorphous silica coating that can be put on this. Silicon fibers are needed and we need to scale up from the current silicon substrates to these 300 kilogram substrates, massive piece. And there's a lot of industrial research and as I said, I don't know of a driver for this in, the, uh, in industry. It's thought that perhaps the community itself is going to have to build its own development facilities for such things. That sounds scary, but if I take two billion dollars as the investment in a 3G detector, 10% of that is $200 million, you can do a lot of R&D. Uh, I know that to build a, an office block at ANU, they take 10% of the cost as the design process. So, you know, I think that's understood by uh, architects. Then the coatings is another multiple parameter problem. Three different wavelengths again, three different temperatures. We've looked at the material technology, IBS is the iron beam sputtering is what's currently used on in the, the uh, interferometers of today. We've got to look at the different types of coatings, the amorphous silica, silicon nitride, crystalline coatings that have been developed uh, using the MBE process, seem to have some uh, very nice properties, but at the moment scaling them up is going to be uh, 
need a significant amount of R&D, and the company that does this is put like a $10 million price tag on scaling up to the sizes we may need. And then there are ideas of multiple material combinations to achieve not only the optical, low optical loss you need, but the low mechanical loss. Typically, getting both of those in the one material seems hard, and I don't think we yet have achieved that. Both low optical loss and low mechanical loss. So the best path is not yet known. There's a lot of studies in the theoretical region, and uh, the uh, quote that I heard from, right from uh, Marty Fay at the last meeting, I thought was a really nice one, which most experimentalists probably won't agree with, that uh, one week modeling is worth 51 weeks in the laboratory. So we need more characterization facilities to look at the optical, the absorption scatter homogeneity. We need to study the thermal noise, the loss mechanisms, and so on. And we have a single large coating supplier risk at the moment for the IBS coatings. So even once we develop the technology we need, we need to expand the, the companies that are able to supply these coatings or we, uh, uh, we leave ourselves vulnerable. Uh, cryogenics, again, we've got to, to, to the possibility of a number of different, the room temperature, the 124 Kelvin operation, 10 to 20 Kelvin operation. Cryogenic challenges, we can't introduce noise via the cooling system. Sometimes we're going to have to op operate underground in terms of ET. We've got to remove heat from the suspensions. We've got to test and improve the best candidates for cooling technologies in terms of the cooling powers, vibration levels, and so on and so on, safety. There's a proof of principle, of course, cryogenic interferometer, and that's CARGRA. So there's a lot of knowledge that's come through CARGRA, what happens when you try to cool optics, and that information, that knowledge, is going to make it a lot easier as we move forward. Newtonian noise is the final one that I put up here. We need to minimize Newtonian noise and we need to understand all those aspects which Rana mentioned earlier. In particular, how you even can measure the atmospheric Newtonian noise if you want to subtract it off. Light sources, I think, are pretty well under control. This is one thing which when I talk to laser builders, they think this uh, type of technology is not going to cause us too much difficulty. Squeezing, I think, is in hand, but this one here, suspensions isolations, I'm, I'm going, you did give me 25 minutes to, suspensions and isolations, it's thought that perhaps a combination of both the current advanced LIGO and advanced Virgo technologies might work well there, but that has to be proven. And auxiliary optics is all the stuff that Rano talked about before that goes around the enabling technologies. And I, this is the one that we can look at and say, how can we, as people joining the community, help in this area? And that, in, in a lot of ways, comes down to, uh, put the notes up here, the size of this subsystem is often underestimated. How we can we hope is to try and, try and understand how these systems impact on the noise floor via simulation and control. A lot of modeling can be done, and here I list the modeling that's being done through the community, and that's being done ad hoc by different parts. And this is one place where we should get a common library going, at least in terms of these simulations, similarly to the controls, and I will leave it there. Thank you, sir. Thank you, David. Uh, we have time for a few questions. People? So in the case of high frequency Voyager and in the case of Cosmic Explorer, the three kilohertz frequency at that, the, for one, the sensitivity became better. It dipped, while for the Cosmic Explorer, there was a peak between 3,000 and 4,000 yeah, hertz. That's, so that's they had different behavior. So what is the cause? The, when you get to 40 kilometers, you get the, the free spectral range of your cavity starts to come into your detection band. So it's this effect of the fact that the, the next free spectral range is impose, in, impacting on the, the, on the sensitivity curve. And it's also a factor of the uh, polarization you choose and so on. So it's, uh, it, 
the, that's not, I think, setting concrete at 40 kilometres because of that peak. So it may be that the designers decide to go to 30 kilometres and push that a bit higher. I don't know if Rana wants to comment. Free spectrum, if you've got an optical cavity, the, it will, uh, you need to resonate the light in the cavity and how many times that the light bounces around before it resonates, is, it tells you the, this uh, resonance condition and that changes as you, as you uh, change the frequency, you get you, every, every multiple of n, you get another free spectral, another resonance condition where the wavelengths add up and where the, the beams add up and together again. Oh, Sandra. Perhaps this is more a question for the panel at the end, but uh, is there an analogous of Voyager for Virgo? Because in the presentation we had from Joe, I believe he was not uh, after uh, uh, Advanced Virgo Plus, there is ET, and is there something that would run at the same sensitivity as Voyager? We are not uh, considering that at the moment, no. But I, can I add that the R&D white paper that the GWIC group, GWIC 3G group have put out, specifically talks about Voyager technology as being able to be put in any, any existing four, four kilometer long or three kilometer long facility. So whilst Virgo are not currently thinking about that, the technology development, should it make sense, could in the fullness of time go into LIGO India, Virgo, or Calgary. I mean, you can develop the technology, but uh, the agencies have to agree to put the money to, um, to upgrade the data from. Absolutely. And I'm probably not the right person to ask about that, as there's a question mark on that map. <laughs> Tarun? Rana, you mentioned the Cosmic Explorer cost being 10 to 1, 9. Uh, what's the cost of Voyager upgrades? Uh, 10 to the 8. <laughs> so for, for people who didn't hear it, Rana said 10 to the 8. The what other questions? That, <laughs> okay. Thank you, David.